it's incredibly lovely to be here and to be with such a thriving society. And I think today has been incredibly well organised. So, Keith, congratulations to you and everybody who's done it. Yeah. I'm also I'm kind of living my best life because my two obsessions in life are cathedrals and islands. And today I kind of managed to whiz very fast around Winchester Cathedral. Didn't see it all of it, <laughs> but it was lovely just to stick my head in and see it. Uh, and then on um, next Saturday I'm going camping for a week on Lundy. I've never been before, so I'm really excited. And the weather looks okay. Touch wood, touch wood. So yes, yeah, so you're kind of you, you, you've given me a kind of a great a great start to the week. Um, right, I thought what I would talk about is um, is RSPB and kind of what it's trying to do now, why it's trying to do it, and and kind of um, just sort of play some of that out really. Um, I think the first thing to say is all of you who are members of the RSPB, thank you so much, and all of you who volunteer for us in some shape or form. Thank you so much. It, it, it's, it's an enormous privilege to lead an organisation that has that level of membership support, very passionate, loyal membership support, um, and also that level of people who are prepared to put skin in the game and put their time into, into what the organisation is trying to do as well. So thank you so much. Um, I hope some, some of this you may know, some of it you may be less familiar with. I thought I'd just start off. Um, that's, that's our kind of, you know, we changed our brand last year. And the bit I wanted to highlight, really, was this bit that says, um, protecting habitats, saving species, and helping to end the nature and climate emergency. So we really wanted to position our work in that crux of these two huge challenges that face us. And, you know, Chris Packham touched on them um, uh, earlier on, this kind of the climate emergency, but also, you know, the nature crisis. And the nature crisis tends to get a lot less airtime and political attention than the climate crisis. And of course, you will all know that they are two sides of the same coin. And if we can't, you know, we can't solve one without solving the other. And that feels really, really fundamental to where we're positioning ourselves. And um, we, uh, we kind of, when we, when we kind of, uh, I arrived, I said, right, what does the RSPB really, really stand for? What does it really believe? And one of the things we did was we condense down kind of what we really believe, what really drives us. When we look at our original founding purpose, how would we interpret that today? And this feels like a really important set of um, uh, core statements for us. So we believe that all species have a right to exist, have intrinsic value, and that their fate is the ultimate measure of conservation success. And not all conservation organisations think that. So species are incredibly important to us. But we also believe that the natural world is fundamental to human health, well-being and creativity through those ecosystem functions, the services it gives us as a species and the inspiration that offers us. So we, we absolutely believe in both. Uh, we believe that the planet faces a nature and climate emergency and that we have a moral duty to do something about that, not only for ourselves but for future generations. So we very much look forward uh, and we think that people are more likely to stand up for, tech, for, for nature if they have had a chance to connect with it and actually understand it. So we think that kind of that path of kind of understanding the natural world, loving it, and then taking action for it is a really important um, process to take people through. And that we can only succeed if there is greater public and political support for nature and that we have a role in mobilising that support. So that's kind of what drives everything we do. And uh, we've got a strategy that takes us out to 2030. But I did just want to touch on it briefly, because it's got 10 really ambitious outcomes. And I get kicked for this in the organisation all the time. They always say to me, oh, it's too ambitious. We're not going to be able to do it. You know, but actually, it was really important to start from what nature needs and then say, and what would be our best contribution to that? So that's how we decided what we needed to do by 2030. And we've got kind of measures around these, and we kind of measure our progress. We report on it every year. But, but it's just, it, just to kind of show the breadth of, of where we're working, really. So we work on UK land, and Keith mentioned our reserves in particular, but we, of course we do work off our reserves as well. We work globally as well, number two, global land. So we work in places like um, Gola, like um, Hutan Harapan in Indonesia, 
year. Um, we work on seas, and that's actually quite a growing area of our work at the moment because of all the offshore wind uh, proposals that are coming through in terms of renewable energy. We work in the UK overseas territory, so 94% of um, the indigenous kind of uh, unique nature of the UK lies in its UK overseas territory, so they remain really important, and not many conservation organisations work there, so actually our role in building the capability of those local organisations is really important. We, of course, do species recovery work. That's fundamental to what we do. Food and farming feels really important right now. 70% of the UK is farmed, so if we can't do something about our farming and food system, then we can pretty much forget trying to solve the nature crisis. So that feels really fundamental to what we do. Nature positive economy, that's all about getting more money in to do the nature restoration work we need to do and finding those new sources of funding. RSPB greening, that's about getting our own house in order in terms of kind of you know, responding to climate change and, and sorting out our own carbon footprint. People engagement is about bringing as many people as we can with us. And RSPB capability is about getting our own house in order as an organisation, I'll be as, if, as efficient and effective as, as we can be. But uh, the six things that I think are really going to change about the RSPB if I have anything to do with it, <laughs> between now and 2030, are here on this slide now. So um, one is about delivering conservation at a greater scale and through deeper collaborations. So this is all about taking a very deep partnership approach to what we do and really trying to make a difference at a much bigger scale. And I think, you know, you all all know that that is what nature needs from us now. We need to be able to do things at a much bigger scale to tackle the issues we're facing. The second shift is about making sure that more people are up for acting for nature and that more diverse people are up for acting for nature. And I was interested to hear from Keith how he's kind of looking at that for you as a society, and that seems really, really important to me. Number three, it's being a bolder and more influential campaigning organisation. So I think we have to have a louder voice and stand up for the things we believe in. Otherwise, we're just not going to cut through. There's a lot going on in the world at the moment, and we have to make sure that our voice for nature is heard. Number four is about actually making sure we feel relevant to the world we're trying to change. If people don't see the relevance of nature, if they think it's just about nice people who like feeding birds in their back gardens we ain't going to get there. So um, that's about really making sure our relevance is understood. Number five, it's about the money, making sure we've got more money coming into nature conservation so that we can do the changes that we want to see. And number six is about the organisation and getting it into shape. So those are the things I think between now and 2030, the RSPB is really trying to change about itself. So how do we do that? <laughs> Yes, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking that. How do we do that? So, the first thing we do is we work on places. And where's this? Franchises. Yes, franchises. Yeah, yeah. So, very close to here, Franchises Lodge. Um, and, you know, this was a real opportunity to get hold of a nature reserve in the northern part of the New Forest. Um, and it's going to allow us to improve the woodland and also the heathland habitats for all the nature species in that area. And it's also, of course, allowed us to think about access for visitors, a residential facility for education and research, which I'll talk about later on, um, and making sure that we can just make a big enough difference in the new forest. Um, and what's been really good is just recently we've been able to acquire Horse Common as an extension to Franchises Lodge, so thank you to anybody who helped uh, donate to that appeal and that's another 40 hectares that we can join on to Franchises Lodge um, and it's particularly about kind of um, the mature broad leaves there but also making sure that we can um, take out conifer that's been put into onto Heathland actually and shouldn't have been there so taking out some of that that conifer as well um, and you know there was a Daily Express appeal people gave us individual donations and the Bannister Trust made us a big donation that's enabled us working with the ESME Fairburn Foundation, who should not be underestimated. They lend organisations like us the money to make an acquisition when we have to, and then we pay them back. And that's a great kind of enabler for making that kind of acquisition. 
Now, this is Hawes Water. Uh, who's read Wild Fell? Anybody read Wild, Wild Fell? Yeah, a few hands going up. It's a great book. It's written by Lo Ske Lee, Lo, Lee Schofield, who is our site manager at Hawes Water, um, about his journey, really, working at this site. Um, it's a United Utilities site, so it's owned by a water company, but we've worked with them since the 1960s on the land around the reservoir, particularly looking at water quality and what we can do to improve water quality, but also what we can do for nature. And then in 2011, we took on two farm tenancies there. We took on Naddle and Swindale Farms. And then we're now um, successfully um, running an endangered landscape partnership. So that now takes um, the work we're able to do in partnership with others, so that kind of bigger scale, more collaboration point, um, across 30,000 hectares. So it's a really, really big area that we're now working in to try and get nature really back into this landscape. Um, and it's called Cumbria Connect. It's trying to do a bit... You, know, you may have heard of Cairngorms Connect, which is a huge area up in Scotland that we're working in partnership on. This is trying to do a similar thing in the north of England. Um, and it's really, really exciting as a project. It's, it's United Utilities, it's us, it's the Lowther Estates, who are a private estate up there, um, and then it's Natural England, and then plus um, a farm cluster as well, who are kind of working on this together. And I think it's going to achieve amazing things. I mean, already, if you go up, if you ever get the chance to go up to Swindale um, or uh, the Nadder the Nada Farmstead in summer, you know, and see the restoration of those water meadows around the re-wiggled beck. It's pretty amazing, actually. And just to be able to appreciate how that could stretch over an even wider area is really exciting. OK, this is one of our most recent acquisitions. This is Glen Crippersdale up in Scotland. Amazing place. Um, I haven't been. Apparently, it's four miles from the nearest car park, so... You might have to have your walking boots on. Um, but it's, it's a former National Nature Reserve. Um, it's right on the tip of the Morven Peninsula, if you've ever been anywhere near there. Um, and it's the south shore of Loch Sunart. Um, it was a site that was owned by Nature Scott. Um, and it's 608 hectares, so again, pretty big, of Western Atlantic oak woodland. And that's often called Celtic rainforest. So it's, it's one of it's this, you've probably seen there's been lots of media attention recently on kind of, you know, rainforest in the UK. And this is a piece of that rainforest. And, you know, again, it gives us the chance to work on a much bigger scale across the whole of the Morven Peninsula to really see if we can get this temperate rainforest restored. That's about extracting rhodi, taking out rhododendron, which has often taken over a lot of it. It's about good deer management to allow natural regeneration to take place. Um, but these are thrilling places to be. If you've ever been able to walk in a piece of temperate rainforest, it really is thrilling. Very wet. <laughs> Even on the driest of days, it's a really wet old atmosphere, which is why it has the great bryophytes and lichens that it does. But they're such fantastic habitats. And to give us the chance to be able to get in and make a difference, again, on a grand scale, working with lots of neighbouring communities, is really, really exciting. Ooh. And then this is... Um, well... This is a sort of generic photo of the East Coast wetlands. Um, and this is all about what we're trying to do um, in, uh, in England this, uh, this year um, to really get the East Coast wetlands uh, taken so, so much more seriously than they are at the moment as such an important um, uh, area for migratory birds and actually kind of native species. And it's... it's You've probably seen uh, recently in the media the wash barrage is back on the, back on the cards. This is a, a kind of proposal to put a huge barrage across the wash uh, in terms of kind of energy generation. Really, really would be devastating for the wash. So that's kind of sits at the heart of this. But this is really about looking at the wetlands from the Humber down to the Thames and getting them appreciated for the wildlife that they support. Um, and we've put in a bid to have them listed as a potential World Heritage Site. So there's one World Heritage Site for nature uh, in, the, in the UK, which is um, the Jurassic Coast. 
uh, down near where I'm from in Dorset and along from, from there. Um, this would be a second one, and it's just it would just raise the profile and give us much more oomph in trying to fight off that kind of proposal, but also do what we need to do to restore those wetlands and indeed create new wetlands um, as climate change has an impact on that coast. So really exciting and really big scale. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish that team, they're, they're a great kind of entrepreneurial team who are driving that forward, and I wish them all the luck in the world. It's a, it's a tough old ask, but I think if we can make it happen, it will be tremendously exciting. And then just looking overseas, this is uh, the St. Helena Cloud Forest. So this is St. Helena, one of the UK overseas territories. Cloud forest, absolutely vital for wildlife. Got some really unique uh, indigenous species that are all at risk because it's shrinking. Uh, and also really important for the water supply on St. Helena as well. And of course, with climate change, that's coming under increasing pressure. Uh, so this is a project we've got going on um, where we're working with um, local uh, conservation organizations to really um, tackle the cloud forest situation, get it better protected, get it restored, get new plants going in. Um, and it's, it's incredibly um, exciting. I think there's a spiky yellow woodhouse, woodlouse in the corner, which is one of these unique species that we're trying to stop vanishing. Um, but, you know, I think last year we were trying to propagate new plants for the cloud forest, and we got 42,000 plants propagated, which was fantastic. And that will start the kind of restoration of the forest, basically, and help improve the water security for the island. So again, a project that's sitting right on that nexus of kind of nature and climate change and trying to do good for wildlife, good for people. And then finally, this is Kazakhstan. So um, we've been working in Kazakhstan in the heart of Central Asia since... 2005, there was a big gap for BirdLife International, which is the international um, birding federation of which we're a part. Um, and it was, it was seen as an important bird area, but kind of nothing was being done to kind of protect it or uh, restore it. And the saiga antelope, these saiga antelope, um, had almost vanished at one point. It was really had suffered an absolutely catastrophic decline. Um, so again, working in partnership with a local delivery partner uh, for bird life, but then also um, other conservation organisations um, from around the world, uh, we've been successful in getting um, the Boki Order State Nature Reserve declared in 2022, and that's a total area of 781 thousand hectares in West Kazakhstan, which will now be far better protected for nature and hang on to that steppe uh, and, and, you know, that important grassland. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of, um, it's, it's interesting working somewhere like that. Um, and it's interesting trying to um, increase the capabilities of the local organisation so that ultimately they can take this on. But it's been um, an incredible journey. And that scale of protection um, is just amazing to see. So that's places. That's the kind of stuff we're doing in places. I just didn't want to move too far from species and remind, remind us all, really, that um, there's also really important work to do around species, and you help with a lot of this in terms of your surveying work, um, because some of our species, as Chris said, are right on the brink. You know, we really are kind of suffering in terms of um, our species' survival. But there are some good news stories. So, you know, I didn't want to kind of move on without showing a fantastic picture of bittern, which, you know, due to lots and lots of hard work from lots of people, is doing relatively better now. And, you know, I often now bump into people who say, I heard a booming bittern, I heard a booming bittern, you know, which you never used to get in the past. So I think that kind of, there are some good news stories, and we know that if we apply the kind of science that BTO does, you know, and really kind of concentrate on the interventions that are right for a species, we know what we have to do. We can bring it back. We can give it what it needs to survive. But of course, the big challenge is always, can we make the rest of the landscape suitable for these species? Or will they just become species that hang on and do all right in nature reserves, but don't do all right in the rest of the landscape? So that is always the challenge. And that is why our work around, for example, farming is really, really important. And this, of course, is a curlew. Not such a good news story as bitterns at the moment. You know, the curlews are absolutely hanging on by their, well, it wouldn't be fingertips, would it? By their feet tips. 
Um, uh, you know, and you know, in, in, in many places, they are right on the edge of surviving as a breeding species here in the UK. Um, and there's lots of work going on with lots of partners to try and do something about curlew at the moment. Um, and uh, I wish them luck. I think, I think our, the changes to our farming system in particular have really caused huge impact on curlew. We know we've got really high predator numbers um, in the UK. That causes huge problems for them as ground nesting birds. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot going against curlew at the moment. But again, there is some, there is some good news starting to come through. So in Northern Ireland, um, just um, uh, last year, we had some really good results in terms of fledglings surviving for curlew um, on the Antrim Plateau. So, and you know, and BTO and others have been involved in some great kind of work to get curlew having better survival rates. So it's one of those really kind of, it's, it, it does feel like it's, it's, we're in the kind of a last chance saloon. So there's a lot of effort being thrown at curlew. Somebody said to me, I, don't, I think we ought to give up on curlew, they said. They're a relic of an old farming system. We should just get, let them go. But, you know, that's not where we're at. <laughs> we're kind of fighting hard with others to hang on to curlew. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can get that situation turned around. And then I couldn't... I couldn't not put a stone curl you up here, could I? <laughs> and I just kind of, you know, stone curl you again, you know, hanging on in a couple of places. Wessex is one of them. Um, and certainly kind of your efforts um, here, uh, working with others, you know, such as ourselves, have meant that we've got some good results coming through in terms of, of pairs of breeding stone curl you, which is really good. But the numbers are still relatively very low so it's an ongoing process but I think the combination of organizations societies such as yourself volunteers landowners all trying to do their bit is making a difference for these birds and do mean that they are their numbers are moving in the right direction from a very low base okay so that's places and species just something on science um, next so this is um a dead gannet uh, floating in the water. This was taken when I went to visit Grassholm uh, last summer. And you'll, have know, you'll know what an impact avian flu is having on our, on our kind of, our seabirds in particular, but other species as well. Um, and it's been a quieter couple of weeks just recently. Most of the geese that were here have now left. And of course, geese are one of the species that's been particularly affected. Um, and we kind of remain hopeful that it might not be as bad as it was uh, last year, but the, the year we just don't know. We're slightly sort of sitting, waiting now for the breeding seabird colonies to come back and to see what happens with them. We know that several gull species have been really badly affected across Europe in recent weeks. Um, there's been an outbreak in black-headed gulls at Rutland Water that's been reported, and um, some great black-backed black gulls and herring gulls have been found dead at the farms. So, you know, gulls seem to be being particularly affected at the moment. Um, I think um, scientists working in, in kind of um, bird conservation have done an amazing job. They've planned and organised another year's worth of seabird census monitoring on the most affected species from last year, which they're going to do this year, which will tell us a lot. Um, and that's being funded by the statutory agencies and the Crown Estate, amongst others. Um, and we had a very successful supporter appeal where our supporters helped us put that together. We're doing lots of policy engagement with all four countries in the UK to try and get them to join up more effectively. They haven't joined up very effectively yet around what should be done and uh, even kind of offering clear guidance about what to do when you find corpses and so on. Um, and, you know, it remains to be seen how it unfolds this year, but it's here to stay. You know, it's not going anywhere and it's having impacts around the world on populations and our seabirds in particular, who we know are already under real pressure, you know, from offshore wind going in, from um, uh, food reductions, from climate change, from invasive species on their nesting colony sites. You know, this is, this is another kind of pressure that they're now coming under. So, you know, we need to do everything we can to understand the disease and also try and manage um, its implications, because the production rate of these seabirds, as you know, is very low, so their recovery from something like this can be very slow. And then finally, we do quite a lot of kind of reporting. So we write reports and we kind of use them to try and drive change, particularly in the policy arena. 
So this was a, a report we wrote about kind of land use and how you need to kind of balance different land uses across the UK. And hopefully that will drive the production of the much vaunted um, DEFRA land use strategy, which we keep getting, being told is imminently coming out. But this is all about how you balance um, basically all the different uses we want to get from our land going forward and make sure there is space for all of them. Um, I think that is a real, a real risk that nature gets squeezed by all the other things we want from our land now. And so getting that balance right is going to be really, really important. And as I said, it feeds into the third area of our work, which is policy. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight this one. This is a, um, a consultation that's out from DEFRA at the moment about shutting the sand eel fisheries in the North Sea. Now, this would have enormous benefit for particularly birds that are dependent on sand eels, so things like kittiwake um, and puffin. I mean, puffins have been predicted to drop by 90% by 2050 if we don't sort out the situation for them. So this is a really important consultation. If you haven't had access to it yet, please have a look at it. Give a response if you can. So we've got an e-action running that you can, you can sign up to. I think 27,000 people have signed up to it already. Just to try and get this over the line. It's mainly um, Denmark that comes and fishes for sand eels in the North Sea. Um, and, uh, you know, there is already, um, it, will all, it will all happen this year because this won't, if, that, if this does happen, it won't happen in time for this year. And there is an absolutely stunning number that I was really staggered by. Um, I think it's 100,000 tonnes will get taken this year. So that's how much of our sand deal are just disappearing. That goes into fish meal and fish oil for animal feed. So again, we're talking about the food system. <laughs> Again, we keep coming back to this, don't we? So, you know, I, I think, you know, if we can get this over the line and persuade DEFRA to do this, it would make a real difference. Scotland has played quite a leading role around this kind of work. It hasn't come forward with this kind of consultation yet, so we will keep trying to persuade the Scottish government that it wants to do similar, but it would make a huge difference for our seabirds. And I keep coming back to farming, don't I? Food and farming. This is Hope Farm in Cambridgeshire. This is um, an arable farm that we acquired 20 years ago, 181 hectares. And what we wanted to demonstrate was that you could run a successful arable farm, but you could do it in a way in which nature could also thrive alongside food production. So we run it as an open account farm. Um, and uh, we about 14% of the land is given over to nature in the form of kind of big, thick hedgerows, margins, um, some kind of overwintering foods, food crops. But it's not, it's not rocket science, but it's made a huge difference. So we've been able to monitor it for 20 years, and we can see the bird populations bounce back. We've seen the butterfly numbers bounce back. And that has driven us being able to say to government, look, if you get to a, a standard where you say 10% at least of farmland is given over with nature as the primary beneficiary, then that will drive change. So again, it's a demonstration site. It's a way of convincing policymakers to do the right thing. And it has been enormously effective. And then finally, this is when we kind of get shouty. This is our campaign work. So you might recognize this. This was when um, the trust government came in uh, last year, and there were three things we felt incredibly worried about. One was um, the idea of investment zones with all kind of EIA environmental restrictions around planning rolled back to enable those investment zones to take place, and very vague as to how big they would be and how much land they would cover. The second was um, the retained EU law bill, the rule bill. Now, that's still working its way through Parliament as we speak. And the third was rumours that the new environmental land management schemes for farming would return to an area-based payment. And we were really worried about those three things taken together. And so we did um, launch this campaign called Attack on Nature, um, and the sector really got behind it. And I think that that made a difference. Um, and although we've still got the rule bill making its way through, and although ELMS, the environmental land management scheme, is not perfect, they are, but, you know, they are, they are kind of much more um, on the agenda and being thought about from a nature perspective than they were previously. Um, and the investment zones kind of 
vanished. They've come back in a slightly different form, but a much more sensible form um, under, under the new government. So sometimes we have to get shouty. I think we do it um, rarely, and because of that, it makes a big difference, but sometimes we have to stand up for what we believe in if we think the threat is big enough. So the final area I wanted to talk about was people. So this is our work to engage people. Um, and um, you'll have seen, hopefully, Wild Isles going out. Um, it's, we're in the midst of transmission at the moment. I think there are two more episodes to go. So we co-produced that series with um, WWF and with the Open University. Um, it's, de it's designed for a mass audience. So um, each episode has been seen by 5.7 million people uh, so far, and a further two million have viewed it on iPlayer, and that's been you know, tremendous. I mean, I mean, that, those are great ratings for the BBC, but they're great reach in terms of people understanding the nature that we have here in the UK, why it's so amazing, and kind of that it's fragile, basically, that it's not just to be taken for granted. Um, and we've launched a campaign on the back of it called Save Our Wild Isles, um, which you've probably seen. And that kind of mass reach is really important, I think, for building the base of people who are willing to stand up and do something for our natural world. And we've also launched something called the People's Plan for Nature. Uh, this was um, um, drawn from 30,000 contributions um, across the UK of what people thought we should be doing for our natural world. And we then ran a citizens' assembly process, a kind of democratic process, whereby people gathered and heard from experts over four weekends. It was really fascinating. If you get to see any of the um, evidence that they were presented with, it's fantastic kind of, you know, introductions to different areas of thinking about nature. And they have come up with a plan of 26 um, actions that they feel we need to take. Um, and that will be incredibly powerful as we move into, for example, manifestos for the next election. It will give us a fantastic platform to be able to try and influence uh, those manifestos so that every political party is doing its bit for nature. And that's not where they are at the moment. So it's going to be really important. And uh, I just wanted to stick up this. This is very close to home. This is um, Cameron's Cottage. Is Corinne here? She's up here. <laughs> she's, she's rattling her jewellery up there. <laughs> uh, so this is Cameron's cottage, you know, which was enabled by um, the Cameron Bespolka Trust working with us. Um, and I, I know there's a, an opening planned in May. Um, but, you know, this is fantastic. It's going to be an incredible facility. Um, it's already being trialled by some groups. It just allows young people to come and have a residential experience, you know, in the middle of... Franchises Lodge, where could be better? And to really kind of appreciate nature, sometimes for the first time, and really get to kind of make that connection, which we hope will be sort of a lifelong experience for them. I'm sure I, I certainly remember experiences like that from my, from my youth. Um, and I just, I just love this project. So, Corinne, thank you to the Cameron and the Spolker Trust and to all of you who have helped with it as well. It's, it's a fantastic project. And that's all about quite deep engagement with people. So that's our strategy. You know, that's what we're doing. We're doing those five things, places, policy, species, science, and people. That's what we do. That's what you help us do if you're members, and that's what you get involved in if you're volunteers. Um, and every year, we have a plan, and we do what we can to forward that strategy. Um, and there are really exciting things going on this year. You know, there's um, great work going on on Turtle Dove. I went out to see some of that in East Anglia the other day. Um, there's great work going on in Belfast, accessing some of the Peace Plus funding to do really important work in Northern Ireland around, um, around Belfast and engaging people with nature. In Scotland, we're carrying on with our Orkney Native Wildlife Project. That's all about getting rid of um, stoats so that we can kind of have the seabirds thriving again. And lots of work on corncrake as well, particularly out in the Hebrides. Um, in Wales, we've got lots of work going on to restore peat and our peat restoration up in the Shetlands actually is just going to up because we're looking to acquire more land up in Shetland. And then internationally right now, we're, we're fighting um, in Indonesia, Hutan Harapan, which is the area of forest that we're involved with. There's a huge threat at the moment from a new coal road. Can you believe it? A coal extraction road, 
we sign up to all these kind of international agreements, don't we? But in the meantime, so we're fighting a new coal extraction road, which is um, being proposed to go through Hooton Harapan, and will fragment that last remain. If you look at if you look at a slide of what's happened to um, dry forest in Hooton Harapan over the last 50 years, and you run all the slides together, it just does this as palm oil and other things come in, illegal logging. So we're left with these fragments, and this coal road would absolutely drive through one of the last remaining areas, which not only would mean loss of, of, of forests, but would also allow all those illegal loggers lots of easy access to come in and do more. So we're fighting that at the moment. So it goes on. You know, it, it, it goes on. But I think um, the thing that I kind of wanted us particularly to respond to, and I hope... I hope those of you who are members and volunteers agree, is that we have to scale up our ambition. You know, this is, this is it. Between now and 2030, I think, is the time when we have to turn it around. And so we have to scale up our ambition, and we have to make sure that we are ready to work with anyone who agrees with us about what we need to do and make it happen. Because without that, we really will be facing just onward decline. And that's not what I'm interested in. <laughs> I'm not interested in facing onward decline. I'm interested in doing something about it. So thank you to all of you who help us do that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, we've got a little bit of time for questions, not much, but I, I'll just have a quick one. You talk about upping our ambitions. Yeah. Most of my adult life, the RSPB's had a million or just over a million members. Mm. The National Trust, which you used to work for, has five million. Now, mm. I know it's a different offer. Where are we going to get to with the RSPB? Could you double your membership ever, or you think we're just where we're at? Um, good question. <laughs> I think... Um, so I think it is a different kind of offer. And actually, that was evidence during COVID. So during COVID, the National Trust battled quite a lot with retaining its membership because quite a lot of its membership, and there's nothing wrong with this, but they're pretty transactional. You know, they, they buy their annual membership because they want to go to nice places to have nice days out. And when they thought they couldn't do that because of COVID, they weren't members. That didn't happen to us. <laughs> so it is a different kind of membership. I think people who support the RSPB on the whole, do it from their hearts. You know, they don't get a lot back. They get a magazine. They get kind of, you know, some kind of free parking. But basically, they do it because they believe in the cause. So that's really powerful. That's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that, um, yes, I think we can grow our membership. I'm not sure we can double it. But we've said that by 2030, we want to get to one and a half million. That's what we're targeting. And I think what we find is if we can get the membership offer in front of people they join. So it's about kind of getting the reach and getting in front of people. But I also think that membership is not the only trick in town. So I think we have to find new ways for people, particularly younger people, to put skin in the game and show their support for a cause like ours that might not be exactly what membership looks like at the moment. So it's, it's a, bit of, a bit of both, I think. Great. We've got time for a couple of questions. So I can see one at the very back. We, we, we will be able to hear, I think. We'd just like to raise your voice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just, just repeat the question. Yeah, so that was a question about rewilding and how much it figures in our plans around land. Um, <laughs> so I think rewilding is one of these contentious terms, you know, and it's, it's kind of become a bit of a polarised term. You know, some people say, I love rewilding, it's the only answer. And some people, you know, particularly farmers, you know, say, I hate rewilding, it's you know, really threatening and it's, it's not going to be the answer at all. I think... We define rewilding as being about working with natural processes and just kind of seeing what pops out at the other end, as opposed to saying, we want to kind of save the bitten and we're going to make the right interventions for the bitten to survive. So, you know, and, and in the RSPB, we do both those things. So around our species work, we're often doing that kind of very interventionist approach. But in some of our large areas, you know, I talked about horse water, for example, um, that is definitely a kind of a rewilding approach. It's saying, let's get the natural processes working right. Let's rewiggle, you know, the beck in Swindale. And let's see what happens for salmon, for example. So, you know, it's absolutely part of 
are approaches, but it's not the only approach. And I think, you know, you need all of them, basically, in order to make the change we want to see. Thank you. Good. Question uh, um, on the left down there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a question about, quite a detailed question about predator control and what our policy is and whether we make a distinction between native and non-native species, basically, I think. Yes, yeah. So um, I think I would start from an understanding of the overall situation around predators in the UK, where we have particularly high numbers of some predators, like fox, for example. I think it's the highest numbers in Europe that we have here in the UK. You're going to correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. Um, so um, that's, that's the kind of the overarching situation. And that is definitely problematic for some of our really threatened ground-nesting birds. So if you think about lapwing, curlew, etc., etc. So you will have seen on some of our reserves, we put up electric fencing to try and kind of keep out predators from nesting sites for some of those ground nesting birds. But we also do predator control, and by that I mean we will ultimately resort to lethal control if we have to, if we feel that those populations are so threatened by predators that we have to resort to that. But we have um, a, a, an ethical board that sits and decides whether we will move to lethal predator con control. And that's different to some landowners, for example, who may be managing, for example, a shooting estate and do much more predator control than we do. Um, in terms of making a distinction between native and non-native species, I think in terms of what kind of control we do, we don't make a distinction between that. Um, but we will ultimately result to lethal predator control if we have to. And we declare the numbers on that publicly uh, because it's obviously a really contentious issue. So, you know, it's, it's the thing that I probably get some, some of my post bag is about that, people saying that we shouldn't do any um, lethal predator control and other people saying we should do far more because otherwise we're going to lose our ground nesting birds. So it's definitely one of a, those really contentious issues for us. Okay, uh, 